So I'm going to start with uh, the one that Adrian Dunn wrote, just because that's where my cursor was when I clicked on it. Um, so the one social-emotional development effect on academic achievement of children with special needs. And I'm just going to scroll my way down to... Chapter 3. Now, there's a couple of things that I would normally have done with you that even Pam hinted at. That So there are a couple of things that I would normally have done in a methodology portion that even Pam hinted at that I know you guys didn't cover in 710. And I know you didn't cover them in 710 is because Mertler as a book only vaguely mentions them. And as best I can tell, you didn't really get much instruction in the way of educational research and things like how to ensure the reliability and validity of your work and what a subjectivity statement was and these kinds of things. Um, so because of that, even though Pam talked about you know how you should talk in your chapter three about what you did to ensure that this work wasn't biased, the fact of the matter is, is you've had no preparation on that. You've had no instruction on it. Um, you know, you, you haven't been taught about triangulation or pilot testing or uh, member checking or peer review or any of those kinds of things. So to ask you to try to incorporate that into your study now um, and to document it now I think would be unfair. Um, so we're not going to worry about that. So when you are looking at any of these samples, um, there are certain sections in here that just aren't going to apply to you in general. Um, the subjectivity statement is one, and that's usually the second last section in each of these chapter threes. The reliability and validity section is also not going to apply to you because you guys, you know, didn't get any instruction on that, and Mertler really doesn't talk about it at all. Um, you know, so those are things that I wouldn't worry about as you're looking at this. The other thing that if you're looking at these to get a sense of um, what it is that they've done and how they've structured it. For the most part, these guys, um, well, not for the most part, these guys in general have had, um, when we did 710, in addition to using whatever the textbook was, when we were doing data collection, I would come in with the books like I did last semester just to give you some ideas. One of the requirements that they had because of that was all of the selections that they made, they had to include references in there beyond the textbook. Um, so the textbook that we actually used is Cresswell. So you'll see it actually it's cited there in the very first meth paragraph of the method, actually the very first sentence of the methodology. Um, for your purposes, I am only expecting that you will use Mertler as a part of any reference that you have, with the exception of the project people, because I told you to pick a particular uh, method of instructional design and gave you the branch book and the website and stuff like that. Whichever one you picked, that's the one you cite. So if you, um, you know, picked, um, well, I'll use the, the, the granddaddy of them all, Dick Caring Carey. You cite Dick Caring and Carey and that's all you need to cite. If you want to cite other people, great. I'm not going to be unhappy about that. The only one I expect you to cite is whomever is the person that you are relying upon for your particular uh, model of instructional design that you selected. Um, so much like the thesis folks, I'm just going to see Mertler. For you guys, I'm just expecting the one citation that's from the whomever informs your method of instructional design. If you want to include others, and this is the same with the, the thesis folks, i um, always happy to see that. And you'll see in Canvas, one of the things that I have included is I've re repeated the um, data collections um, item that we had last semester where I've linked in several other resources that you could use. Um, you know, so there's different articles or reports for each of the different data collection methods that you could cite, I'm not expecting you to. This just provides additional information for, you know, at, at the time for when you were putting together your IRB and then for when you actually implemented your project. Um, you know, you don't need to include them as you tell the story of it. So that's one of the other differences that you'll find here. Um, all of their individual sections will be much more highly cited than what yours will. 
Um, now, the way in which APA continues to work, obviously, is that if you've cited somebody and you're continuing to talk about stuff from that individual and there's nothing breaking them up, you don't need to recite them. So many of you will cite them once per section and that's it. Um, because everything else you say in that section is going to be informed by that person if all you're doing is citing one person. So the format is going to be roughly the same though. Uh, yours uh, will be slight, uh, there will be minor differences I should say. So if you look at the beginning, for these guys one of the things basically I just told them to do was to restate the purpose of their thesis and then restate their research questions and then indicate their selection of methodology. Now you'll note that the guide that you guys have um, provides a little bit more detail because they want both a general introduction and a background to how the study was conceived or how the project was conceived. Now that's still only going to be probably a couple of paragraphs um, and I do mean a couple. Like You're likely going to have one paragraph that introduces it and one paragraph that provides a bit of background. Um, so what I would do for those two paragraphs is go back and look at your chapter one and ask yourself, if I were to summarize that in two paragraphs, what would I put in there? Those are your first two paragraphs, regardless if you're a project or a thesis person, because it's the same for both. Now, in terms of the thesis folks, the next part talks about, you know, the research design. Now, unfortunately, the terms that they're using here are a little bit generic because um, research design really by definition is the methodology. Um, methodology refers to a systematic design from which research is um, conducted. Um, what I think that, and in looking at the descriptions that they have on pages, I guess it's around 12 or something, 12 or 13, Sorry, 14 is when it gets to it. Um, when they're talking research design, they are referring to what Mertler refers to as methodology. And when they get to methodology, they're talking about what Mertler is referring to as the data collection methods and the data analysis methods. Regardless of how you set this up, and, and the way in which I would do it is if you're a uh, research, or if you're a thesis person, under the research design section, I would have a paragraph or two that basically outlines this is the methodology I chose, this is why I thought it was appropriate, and this is how I actually implemented this methodology. Now, if you're an action research person and you had multiple cycles, chances are you might have a second paragraph. If you were a case study person where you just did, you know, one cycle of research to collect stuff for the case, chances are for your research design section you've got a single paragraph. Um, but either way, it's going to be one or two paragraphs depending on how much detail you need to be able to describe why what, well, three things. What you chose, so I chose action research, I chose case study, why you thought that was appropriate, um, and this gets back to in Mertler when he talks on uh, chapter, actually it's chapter four when he gets into the basic research designs. Um, so there's a section there in case study. And then actually all of chapter two is on action research. And if you go into Canvas, you will see there's a content item that tells you a little bit about um, research met research methodology, so there's a little thing about action research, a little thing about case study, and I use Mertler for both of those, so you can actually use that idea that he's talking about in there as to the rationale for whichever one you pick, and then what it looks like in your context. So essentially, how did you do it? All right, and that's what most of this chapter, the first half of this chapter is going to be, and um, in the case of the project folks, it's mo most of what the second half of I say second half, it actually ends up being more than half in terms of um, the amount, but the second half in terms of the um, topics that they list um, for the project folks. Because um, that sort of telling of what you did is, is in that um, project design section. Um, 
so for the thesis folks again the research design a paragraph or two what methodology you picked why it was appropriate and then how you set it up in your class the next thing it asks for you guys um, when you actually look at the section it says methodology and when you look on page 14 to get some guidance about that this is essentially where they want a more detailed description of what it was you did starting off with a description of the sample now you likely included a general description of this in chapter one this is where you want to be a little bit more specific providing essentially the types of things that you would have liked to have known about a lot of the literature that you read as an example you know so when you saw there were these three studies that all looked relatively the same in terms of what they were you know trying to achieve one of the main differences oftentimes was you know where the study was conducted who it was conducted with the makeup you know of the participants you know from grade level to various demographics those kinds of things um, so you want to provide whatever information you think is relevant to that in that sample. Um, so that's going to be the first thing that you've got um, in the methodology. The next thing that you're going to have in the methodology section is your data collection methods. Now, everyone in here had at least two methods. You will take one or two paragraphs per method and essentially do the same thing you did for methodology. Why did you pick that data collection method and then how did you actually do it in your class? In these how did you actually do it in your class, the level of detail that you want to write it in is enough that somebody else in theory could pick it up and approximately replicate what you did. Right? So in theory, a student could, in the fall, redo your study, just redoing it in their environment. That's sort of the level of detail that you want to provide. Um, you know, so things that you're going to be you know, particular to include in there, if there are certain timed sequence things, like every three weeks I did this, or after they completed you know, this milestone or that milestone, or it was important that you know, they all did it at the one time so we did it every Friday or every other Friday you know these are the kinds of things that you want to you know let the reader know as you're going through um, you know that's sort of the, the level of detail that you're looking at the next thing that I am going to ask in here and in, in the um, and this is one of the things Pam was uh, mentioning that you know, she's seen it changing depending upon the way in which people write it up. Um, I think it works better by having in the methodology section describing your data analysis methods. So after you do data collection methods, do data analysis methods. If you remember, most of you in your IRB said you were going to analyze the qualitative data one way, the quantitative data another way. This is essentially where you write one to two paragraphs about each of those ways that you said. This is where chapter six in Mertler comes in. Um, for that matter, with the, I forgot to mention, when you are doing the data collection methods, that's where chapter five comes in. So all of the methods of data collection are mentioned in chapter five and discussed in chapter five. The data analysis methods are all discussed in chapter six. So again, why was it appropriate? And then what did you actually do to analyze the data? So looking at, and I want to provide some examples of, of how you can see this. And this is why I brought up um, this chapter three. So starting off with this, you'll see um, the methodology section, which for you guys is going to be the research design section. Um, you can go through action research methodology served this study well because. You know, so they're using an action research one. This is essentially why I'm using. Now in their case, because they had to use multiple pieces of literature, I required one paragraph on why it was important, one paragraph on 
you know, what it actually looked like in their classroom. In your case, that's all going to be combined in likelihood into a single paragraph, which means that in most cases, you're only going to have a sentence or two on why it was appropriate because you're only using Mertler as to your rationale for why it was important. Then they get through and they actually start to specifically talk about their individual context. And you'll notice, for the most part, the citations stop at that point. Because now they're starting to get personal and talking about, this is what it looked like in my context. Um, you know, so they can go through and talk about, you know, they included a variety of people as they did it. Um, they, um, you know, looked at three to four specific strategies that they were trying to look at as a part of this particular project. Um, and then they tell you what those strategies were. Um, you know, and, and use each of these, well, the first thing I would suggest is when you go in and look at them, find one that has your methodology. So if you use the case study, don't use one that uses action research as your, you know, as an example for you. If you did action research, don't use the case study as the example. Um, the next thing that they have in there, as I told you guys to include, is that study setting. Right? And in this case, again, it's I told them two to three paragraphs. Most people had two paragraphs where they go through and basically tell you about where the study took place. Now, these guys, for whatever reason, I think probably because the first examples that they looked at, um, the first cohort looked at, um, included a lot of information about the broader context, they tended to provide one paragraph about the broader context and then one paragraph specifically about their school. Um, if you're doing an action research study, really it's only the specifics to your individual context that's important. Um, you know, the same thing with the, the project folks. You know, as a component, uh, you know, when you're going through and providing some of the background to how the project was conceived, um, you know, you don't need to talk much about your school and your school district um, unless your project was at a school level. You know, so if your project was in like just a individual grade level or individual subject area or what have you, just focus specifically, you know, give me some sentences just about that specific environment. Um, you know, for those that are doing a case study, some of the broader information might be useful. Um, I'll let you determine whether or not you think that is um, appropriate for your particular study um, as you're looking at it. Um, so once they get past that, oops, I went back up again. They went through and they started that a collection section. Um, what they will do with all of theirs is with the research questions, they will identify the specific data collection method that went with each research or went with each research question. For most of you, you have two methods, and both methods go with however many questions you've got. So if you did surveys and tests and you had three research questions, you use surveys and tests for every single research question. So this kind of table here is not useful when you tell your story. The same thing with the project folks when you get to that evaluation section. You know, if you have three data collection methods and you're using all three for both objectives, this is not useful. But if you have, like they have here, you know, if you have two objectives and there's three methods, but two methods go with one objective, two methods go with a different objective, then delineating that the way in which Adrian has done here, might be useful when you're describing your evaluation. You know, and I'll leave that up to you. In all honesty, you could do these with two sentences. You know, for the first research question, I used focus groups and surveys to collect data. For the second research question, I used those same surveys as well as observations. You know, or change research question or project objective and you've done the same thing in sentence format. Um, you know, so if you are doing this, and this probably applies a little more to the project folks than the, the thesis folks, um, this can be a useful way of highlighting which methods go with which objective, but it might not be applicable to your particular environment, your particular context. Um, again, if it's not useful, don't, you know, don't incorporate that into your story. 
you'll see these guys will go through and they had roughly the same instructions that you guys do. Um, you know, give me, in their case, I used to tell them one or two paragraphs about why the method was appropriate and one or two paragraphs about how you actually use the method. And in your case, I've said one or two paragraphs that do both of those things. So you could have a single paragraph that does both where they have four paragraphs. They also were told, like the methodology, that they had to have multiple citations in there. You guys only need to have Merkler in there. And if you've already used them in this section already, obviously you're not going to cite them again at this point. Um, but you'll see that the way in which they're set up, and again, you can look at it and see some of the reasons why. And this is actually quite useful, uh, a useful way to use a lot of these as examples. You can go in and see, you know, why did they use surveys? They use surveys because surveys are good at collecting this type of data and this type of data. That's still true for your context. And I'm willing to bet if you were to look hard enough, Mertler probably makes that point. Um, you know, so that might be an easier way to find some of that rationale um, that you need to include in there. And then they should, if they've done it correctly, go through and actually provide enough detail that you could go in and do what they did. So in this case, you'll see they've got the second paragraph here is designed to essentially go through and tell what they did. Um, you know, so they had a focus group that had a bunch of stakeholders that included apparently a special ed teacher, a parent of a child with special needs, a school counselor, and a general ed teacher. Um, there were several questions and she puts the questions that she used in Appendix A. Um, so you can see the focus group protocols in Appendix A there. And um, you know, the reason why, she, you know, the sort of the, the questions were focused around this idea of social develop, social emotional development strategies incorporated in the academic curriculum. Um, she says that um, the group were given the prompts. I'm assuming that means in advance because it says on the top of 37 there, the group was given six thought prompts that led the group discussion. Um, you know, and she provides a little bit more different. The responses were collected and the researcher reflected upon uh, and used the feedback to inform strategies for the rest of the, the project. You know, so in theory, if you had Appendix A in front of you, you know which five people or four people that she wanted to, you know, you could in theory go through and replicate what she did there. Um, you know, and you should have the same thing here with the surveys that she went through. Um, so sent out to all the faculty in the school, see Appendix B for a copy of it. Um, apparently it included, when she says all faculty, she means teachers, administrators, paraprofessionals, cafeteria staff, custodian, and security staff. Um, she didn't have control over the return responses which means that she didn't have it set up where I send it to eight people and I know which eight pe you know which five people completed it so I can send reminders out to the three people that did it. She just had a general survey link that was sent out to everyone. So if she wanted to send out reminders, she had to send out reminders to everyone, even though some of those people might have already completed it. Um, at least that's what she tells us here in, in this third sentence that she has here. Uh, there were many reminders sent out. She doesn't exactly tell us how many. Um, and then she tells us a little bit about the instrument itself, 13 questions, some multiple choice, linear scale, open-ended. It was done purposefully that way. Um, you know, and here's some of the reasons why she did it. Apparently she used the second one as well, this attitudinal measures. So you get starting to get the pattern here. Right. The ones that will probably be a little bit more useful to you, I think, as you're looking in terms of um, the items, is the data analysis. Um, one of the things most of you said that you were going to be using, let's use Mertler's term here, for your qualitative stuff, you indicated that you would be using a inductive analysis 
the most common form of inductive analysis is constant comparative. You will see all of the samples in the, the Sacred Heart Digital Commons. They will actually describe it as constant comparative. So they won't call it inductive analysis. So if you said you were going to use inductive analysis for your qualitative stuff, the most common form of it, and I would argue the easiest form of it, is constant comparative. It is exactly how it sounds. You are constantly comparing the data as you're going through, in most cases, doing an open coding model. So essentially, you don't have a specific code book in mind. You're just going through, and as things stand out to you, you're assigning it some kind of label so that you can go back and find all of the things that have that label. To put it another way, everything that talks about X, you shade it in pink. Everything that talked about Y, you highlighted yellow. So that way when you're done, you can go back and see, okay, let me just read all of these yellow portions now because those are all the ones that I said were about Y. Um, you know, that's essentially what constant comp comparative is. And the reason why they call it, you know, the, the high idea of constant is in there is because when you get three pages into something, you may be noticing something now that's becoming common that you know you read earlier, but it wasn't as noticeable earlier, so you didn't code it, code it or color it or underline it or whatever before, so you need to go back and look at it a second time. So you're essentially going back over the data until to use the, the researcher's term, and you'll see it used in a couple of cases here, until you've reached saturation, where essentially you've gotten as much from the data as you can. And there's no magic point as to when you reach saturation. It's just when you think that you found everything in the data you need to find in order to answer your research questions. When you've hit that point, or in the case of the project folks, when you've essentially um, been able to determine whether or not your objectives were or weren't met. When you hit that point, that's when you've reached, you know, to use the methodological term saturation, that's when you stop. Now, the other thing that most of you picked was descriptive statistics, and you'll see um, a lot of the folks in the Sacred Heart one use descriptive statistics as well. Um, a couple of them will use some other things. You'll see a couple of t-tests in there. Um, you might, if there's at least one person who did a... Um, so descriptive statistics is another one that you'll see they commonly used. So if you want to go in and, and borrow some of the, the, the ideas that they have there, some of the rationale they have there, uh, by all means do so. Um, you'll see that for many of them, they used Google Forms as their survey. Um, provider. So I think that's one of the reasons why they set a timer on it because it seems to go from like sweat box to ice box. Um, so. And Colby is in the comfort of sitting on top of his bed in there right now, but we won't. So we have an odd room here, Colby, I have to say. So, um, this whole reliability and validity section that you'll see in all of them, you guys ignore that. Um, you didn't, no one covered it with you in 710, so I'm not going to spend time covering it now. Um, you know, because, again, that's a class. I would have spent a full class on looking at the eight or ten different ways in which you could have done it and told you all that you had to choose at least two or three as a part of your study. Similarly with the subjectivity statement, um, that's something that actually I would have had you write as a part of 710. Um, so the fact that, you know, and we, you would have sort of revised it throughout as you're going in. Um, the other thing that's going to be useful in these samples for Chapter 3 is their summary. Now keep in mind, these guys have a separate Chapter 3 and 4 where Chapter 3 looks at all of the methodological things. Chapter 4 looks at the results. In your case, those two are combined into a single chapter. All right. So if you're looking at any of these samples, keep in mind that they have a five-chapter model, whereas you guys have a four-chapter model. So their chapters 3 and 4 are just your chapter 3. 
Um, so when you're looking at their summary, keep in mind that that's only an example of what the first half of your summary is going to be. Actually, probably first third of your summary. Because uh, for the thesis folks, and I didn't get as far as summary for the thesis folks, I did for the um, project folks, but for the thesis folks, what I would recommend for your summary, one paragraph that summarizes your methodology, and then one paragraph that summarizes what you found for each of your research questions. So if you had two research questions, you should have two paragraphs for the results portion. Unless they were fairly directed research questions. So that sort of goes through the outline of chapter three. So what I want to um, transition to 